This is Battleground PA, a Penn Live podcast discussing the issues that matter to Pennsylvanians and documenting the events in the Keystone State and beyond that could shape how you vote in the 2024 elections. Well, greetings, everyone. This is Joyce Davis. I'm Penn Live's outreach and opinion editor. And this is Battleground PA. Yes, we're on the battlefield once again, and we have our dear, dear, dear friend, Jeffrey Lord, who is hailing in from the Republican side of things. Welcome, Jeffrey. Good to be here, as always. As always. Too bad there's nothing going on. Nothing, not much. No, but we'll talk about that. We also have, delight to have with us, John Cole, who is a reporter with the Pennsylvania Capital Star. Thanks for joining us, John. Always happy to be back. Thanks, Joyce. All right. We got a lot of J's here. We got Joyce, we've got Jeffrey, we've got Joe, and now, I mean, John, and we've got Joe. <laughs> Admiral Joe Sestak. A lot of people know that name very, very, very well in Pennsylvania. Admiral, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Thanks, Joyce. And please, uh, it's easier. I don't want to feel old, so Joe is perfect. All right. All right. Let, let me let those who, because, you know, we do get some younger uh, readers and viewers here, but Rear Admiral Joe Sestak is um, really a retired uh, Rear Admiral from the U.S. Navy. At the, he retired after 31, 31 years of service. And that wasn't enough. He wasn't tired enough from all of that. He then went on to serve Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District uh, uh, as a U.S. Congressman from Pennsylvania. So I would say you've gone above and beyond the call of duty, uh, Admiral Sestak, and that's why it's going to be hard for me to just say just old Joe. <laughs> so with that, let me just say this. I think something happened last night, and I was late getting to bed. I wonder what it was. Can anybody fill me in on what happened last night in, <laughs> with the Democrat? It's, well, John, you want to go? You, you're the reporter. I, I, I appreciate it. I, I'm sure it was past most of our bedtimes last yes. night. Particularly yeah. those it was of mine. Us, no, I didn't see the ending. <laughs> particularly those of us on the East Coast. So as we're recording this right now, um, day or night one of the DNC took place in Chicago uh, yesterday and President Joe Biden delivering the keynote address late last night. Uh, the speech, I believe, beginning in the Eastern time zone, 1126, I think, was around that time, and it went past midnight. Uh, it he was went past, past, past. Yes, it yeah, did. He, he was originally scheduled to speak earlier in the evening. However, as we know at conventions, I don't think this is just a Democrat or Republican thing. Like Jeffrey can attest to being at many uh, GOP conventions that some uh, speakers were long-winded, and the schedule, it's tough to keep that tight schedule. So uh, President Biden spoke last night. And, uh, you know, an address where it's interesting because just a little over a month ago, we thought he'd be the one accepting the nomination yep. on Thursday evening. But instead, he was giving, um, you know, an address on Monday night, uh, passing the torch, so to speak, to Vice President Kamala Harris, who will be delivering the address on Thursday evening and formally accepting the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. Well, I'll tell you, there were several say, highlights George. of it for me, Jeffrey. I'm going to turn it over to you, but I have to say that Hillary, I thought, did an extraordinary job uh, riling up the ladies. And uh, Reverend Warnock, I mean, you really had to listen to him. But Jeffrey, let me hear what you have to say. Well, I, I have to say, uh, unaccustomed as I am to defending Joe Biden, I thought he was treated shabbily, to be candid. I mean, he is the sitting president of the United States uh, for, for people to be saying what you all said here that you went to bed i mean that you're you clearly you weren't alone in all of that um they should have had him booked for you know nine o'clock eastern time prime time or eight o'clock or what have you to to have him pushed back until whatever it was eleven thirty or whatever i just thought you know that that was not nice and that's and, an interesting take i stayed up the whole time i did not i said this is history in the making i'm not going anywhere so that admiral says that why don't we bring you in i'm sure you saw that let's get you get your views in here oh uh, i have i think jeffrey jeff has a point uh um but you're younger so you could stay up but uh <laughs> the point that i point that i i just want to comment upon was how what goes around comes around uh, if you know aoc got up to make a comment because she'd been being hit up by the Republican Party on being a bartender. Yeah. You go back, and all I could think about was going back to the Republican Lincoln 
being accused by Douglas during the Douglas Lincoln debate of being a bartender. But I like his response a little better. He said, yes, but every day I would open up the door. The first man on the stool was Douglas. <laughs> I couldn't help but think about that, you know. There you go. There you go. Now, that's why it's great to have people here with some sense of history and have lived and helped make some of the history. But if we are in for, I think, a few days that, is, that are really going to be historic, whether you're on the right or the left or in between, people need to watch, I think, what's happening. And so, so we'll be, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I would just say this. I don't remember a convention of either party in which the opposite party doesn't automatically declare the whole thing to have been a disaster when it when they're <laughs> yeah. finished. I mean, I just think that's sort of the lay of the land. Sometimes they may be right, you know, like 1968 with the Democrats and all of the commotion and all that. And going back even further, the Barry Goldwater Convention in 1964 and all this kind of thing. So it isn't always, but but by and large, uh, you know, that's what opposition parties are for is to say, well, they just had their convention and they did A, B, C, and D and all of it was wrong. And I don't think you're going to be able to change that. Well, you might be able to change it if you have some history-making stuff like having an African-American Asian woman be nominated. I mean, there is something about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, maybe I'm too excited. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. it, it kind of robs you up a little bit. It is history, Jeffrey, in the making. But anyway, let's let's move on because we did spend last our last battleground. We were fighting it out over this Project 2025. And actually... Just to give you a little bit of an overview, we had one of the people responsible for kind of pulling some of these uh, thoughts and ideas together for the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Brian Phillips came and he kind of walked us through why they thought this was. And actually, it's something that many think tanks do is they're looking ahead to uh, the next administration. They want to give their imprimatur onto something. They want to, here's what we think ought to happen. I think that's the context that many readers need to, I think, have, unless I'm wrong and correct me. This is the Heritage Foundation's um, attempt to influence what the next administration, especially if it is a conservative Trump administration, will do. So uh, to me, and I'm just glad that, uh, that that was explained, and it also helps understand why maybe President Trump is waiting to see whether he likes a lot of this stuff that's there or not, as Jeffrey explained. But he laid out, and the one thing that I came away with, Jeffrey, and you correct me if I'm wrong before we go, go to the Admiral, is, um, I mean, I was just taken away about, yeah, this is going to be a, a hectic tumultuous period if indeed there's a President Trump and this document gets uh, implemented, there's a lot of turmoil that's going to be happening, right, Jeff? Yeah, I think that's I think that's very true. I think that, uh, it, you know, not for nothing is Washington often called the swamp. And I lived there a long time and worked there a long time in House, Senate, White House, Cabinet, things, et cetera. And, and you've got an institutional situation where You've got all these thousands of people in thousands of jobs uh, and anybody, and I emphasize anybody who is perceived as a threat to that job security is going to cause all kinds of uh, commotion. And when you get uh, an outsider, a Democrat like Jimmy Carter or a Republican like Ronald Reagan or now Donald Trump, uh, yeah, you're going to get a lot of turmoil. And I imagine... Assuming Donald Trump wins, that is going to be the issue from the get-go. Is uh, so. Well, you, let me, you know, it, it's yeah, a problem. I, I know what you're saying, but they but they intentionally want to blow up everything and, as they say, redirect things under the administration. So, Admiral, let me bring you in here. You clearly are aware of this document. And I'm going to tell you, I don't. I, I don't agree with Jeffrey that the Washington area is a swamp. I just, I love that area. I love being around I love there. I too. It's an exciting place. And you're now in, in Alexandria, which is a fascinating place to be full of history. But let's bring your thoughts into your own, on just this document and why so many people are looking at it with trepidation. Yeah. First, I want to say there are some really good things in it. For example, the focus on China. I mean, I may disagree here and there on it, but I think the gentleman who did, or gentle lady that did that section, it's really got it pretty well. But, and, and there's several other things too. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to throw it all out. My concern is similar to yours. I mean, I, I worked in the bowels of the Pentagon, but also very, very closely with the bowels of the intelligence agencies. I mean, before I went on the ground in Afghanistan, for example, uh, early in the war, uh, for a special short mission, man, I went over to NSA and spent a lot of time down there. Now, on the whole, I, are there problems? Yes. I mean, I do think some of the things they have in there in civil service, for example, of um, how long it is that to get someone, a poor performer, trying to get them out. I mean, there was just a report out again this past week by the Partnership for Public Service, which had done a couple of years ago a similar study with the Volkner Institute uh, Alliance, I think it's called, where they 40% of those who work in civil service say, you know, I know poor performers, they've been identified, but they're still working here. I mean, there's things like that. Also, I think we can do things like it points out about, uh, like what President Obama brought in. And, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm quite nice to have read that this uh, Project 25 note, noted that of how much he did to try to get objective civil service exams that it even said President Trump took aboard, tried to do more, but couldn't get it all through. My concern comes with the following. Just a couple ones, but then we could discuss them. It is this idea that you're going to take 50,000 of these positions and then put somebody uh, uh, like we do for political appointees, but make them in the civil service a, a, a more a, a political appointee, so to speak. I, do I understand this? I do it. Oh, gosh, it's extraordinarily difficult to work issues to the bureaucracies. I get that. Yeah. But then I think we need to keep in mind the era of the Democrats. They changed and used the nuclear option in the Senate and said, we don't need a culture vote anymore to get ju uh, judicial nominees to, to the courts like district court, et cetera. So they did that. They politicized it, so to speak, to get these judges on. And then four years later, the nuclear option was really done by the Republicans saying, you did that for that, we'll do it for the Supreme Court. And therefore, you got a Supreme Court that got said like. So all of a sudden, you're going to put 50,000 new political appointees in for four years. Let's say Mr. Trump, President Trump wins again. Four years later, you can't run again. Let's say the next guy loses. Then we get another 50,000 guys in, or gals, that are of the other party. It opens up this back and forth and the instability of it all. Number two, I also think that I felt, quite frankly, a little offended, if I might by the line in there that says most enlisted and officers, except for three stars and four stars now serving, can be considered true patriots. Because those three and four stars, it says, who are leading our military today have grown up to during the Obama administration. I mean, those are the words in there. And so all of a sudden there's this view that the military is political. And if I could, and so they're going to have, what they said is we need to bring before uh, the National Security Council review three and four star nominees and actually go in and make sure they're not, and it says these words, they're not advocates of social engineering. Climate change, it even mentions. So I only go back to General Jack Keane, probably one of the best generals you could have. As a matter of fact, President Trump wanted him to be his Secretary of Defense before General Mattis, he took, but General Keene turned it down. After Mattis was removed or resigned, uh, I've forgotten which, um, then they asked Jack Keene to do it again. And he reclined because of his wife, all right? But he talks to Trump all, was doing all the time. I mean, it's a real, I mean, he was an officer. You know, conservative, I get all that. But he was the one the Obama administration asked to do and look at what some had considered another social engineering thing during the Clinton administration, don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. So this man was asked to find out if it was going to be, should we do away with it? Well, he was asked to look at, it, if it, is there any impact to military readiness? When he came before Congress, and I was now a congressman, and he was asked, he explained why it would not hurt military readiness. And I was the junior congressman on the committee. So I got to ask the last question. So I said, sir, I just have one question. What do you personally believe? And he looked at me 
just pushed her out of the gym. And he said, no one has ever asked me that question. Well, personally, I do not agree with it. Yeah. It was me. But I wasn't asked that question. I was asked, will it harm military readiness? Which, which by the way, the book, the Project 25 says the priority should be military readiness. Okay, we don't want social security training to affect it. But two things to take away from that. That's exactly what our military men and women should be. We're in an oath to a constitution, not a party or anything like that, despite their personal beliefs, if it doesn't break the constitution or anything. And he did it. That's good. Yeah. But here's the second one. Would a person like General Mattis, who opposed the issue of not having transsexuals in the military, because we had them, all right? Well, you know, you all of a sudden got to talk about before you, if you're going to raise up and rate a rank, it's not rate, rank, I apologize. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Would be that personally, three rules you were told when you were reported into the wardroom of a Navy ship. You never in the wardroom talk about women, politics, or religion, period. And so to me, when you see this thing saying good governance is determined by a belief in the book of human nature. Yeah. yeah. And so I here's that's my concern uh, of several that I have, despite some positive things in this thing. And I'll stop with that and listen to the... Well, yeah, no, I'll just bring John into this bit for, for two reasons. The, the issue of the laws of nature give me pause too. And you, it's hard to find somebody any more religious than me, but that even that for me, my husband's a pastor and, you know, I just gave a sermon on Sunday at the United Methodist Church. So, but still to have that someone interpreting what the laws of nature mean is a, a little squeamish to me, but John, what are your thoughts on this? And even this kind of a little bit of what we also face in state bureaucracy. I mean, a new governor comes in, but he's still got those old experts there. He's got to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, I've not read Project 2025 front to back, but I will right. say from the reporting end of it, covering uh, many a campaign events this cycle and previous cycles, um, the Democratic Party, at without fail, most events I've gone to the past few months has uh, brought up Project 2025. And I'm talking about this not just for the presidential race, they're talking about this as a potential impact on down ballot races as well. So without fail, anytime I reach out for comment from the Democratic Party on something, they'll usually throw in a comment referencing uh, Project 2025. So just wanted to let the audience know that um, the Democratic Party, at least in Pennsylvania, who, whom I am most uh, often communicating with because of the races I'm covering with are in Pennsylvania, it is an issue that the Pennsylvania Democrats are talking about at length. But I think it is worth noting, and I'm sure Jeffrey can speak to this as well as our, our Republican pundit here. Um, uh, former President Trump is seemingly trying to distance himself from it. It seems, at least in certain appearances, I know at certain press conferences, he's trying to get away from it uh, because it's not, it, again, his campaign didn't write it, although I suppose um, Project 2025 is backed by those who either worked in the Trump administration or are supporters of his. Wait, so, only... so that's, yeah. why I, I, yeah. I, that's why I started out with this saying, look, having been in Washington, you think tanks are everywhere and they're all working on some sort of document right that they think the next administration should have if, if you're on the liberal or on the conservative side. so that's why i'm wondering if we've just taken this thing too far but go ahead john just and just one thing to add even though i mentioned again democrats have talked about it at length the republican events i've covered and i've covered you know dozens at least this year alone if not more um there's only been one event in which I heard Project 2025 talked about promoting it. And Jeffrey was actually at that same conference. This was months ago, Jeffrey, at uh, the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. I think to my recollection in this year, that's the only time I heard a Republican talk about it promoting it because it was someone from the Heritage Foundation right. delivering the address at this mm -hmm. conservative conference, Jeffrey. So point being, I don't see the down belt candidates in Pennsylvania talk about it. I can tell you, just this past few, de uh, past few days, um, Monday, uh, Senator J.D. Vance was in Philadelphia. I was there in uh, attendance covering it. Vance made no mention of Project 2025. Former President Trump was in Wilkes-Barre. 
And on Saturday, I was in attendance covering it. He made no mention of it then. So I think some Republicans, at least again, Trump, Vance, and some of the down ballot candidates certainly aren't going out of their way to talk about it. Maybe they view it as something that could hurt them politically. And that's one thing I actually posed a question to Jeff. From the Republicans you're talking to, do they see this as a potential negative? Do they see the, the attacks or the, the comments made by Democrats working as an effective campaign strategy using Project 2025 against Trump and down ballot Republicans? Well, I'm sure Democrats will use it in a negative light. I don't have any doubt of that. As to President Trump, I think part of uh, his reaction is uh, caused by the fact that he's already been president and therefore he knows from experience what it's like to run a White House, to run a government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and wants a free hand in doing that and uh, probably takes a little uh, uh, resentment at uh, the Heritage Foundation taking it's a lot to telling him what to do. Now, that said, I, I have to tell you, I remember all the way back when Ronald Reagan was elected, the Heritage Foundation was brand new, and they did a version of this, and they also did, which I found fascinating at the time, particularly since I was thinking of working in the administration. I was working on Capitol Hill at the time, but they put out this enormous multi-Bible-sized book about every single job that was available in the federal government. Uh, for for people for in other words to fill it with Reaganites and all that kind of thing, so we, we have in a sense been here before, and I think that uh, from the Trump point of view, he wants to maintain his options, and probably takes a little uh, uh, a little irritation at other people trying to you know tell him what to do. Admiral, yeah, that getting circling back around to you, I think that that is a very good analysis there that. Why should anybody tell President Trump what he's going to do when he gets in the office? He's got it all worked out. But but still, I, I guess where I'm going to with this is that it still is a, a snapshot or a look into the thinking, at least on this other, the ideology of this other side. And that's where I think there's a little pause from people that will really uh, have a large number of thinkers, conservative thinkers, willing to simply massively deport people. And we're, we're, we have a number of thinkers willing to look at laws of nature to determine who has rights and who doesn't. If you're a childless couple, maybe you won't have rights. I don't know. But you see, I'm so, so is that what the crux of the concern is? Here's the thinking that is going to uh, dominate for years or longer if we have a Trump presidency. Admiral, is that is yeah, that you? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, I thought you said John. Sorry, I apologize. Um, I think it is. Uh, there is some similarity between Agenda uh, Forty One. I think it's called right, Jeffrey. That present on his web. Yeah, there is. If you look at those and try to line up this nine hundred and some page document. By the way, John, the only reason I really read this whole thing <laughs> was because. When I was supporting Obamacare, they used to say, did you read the whole thing? You know, because it was a thousand <laughs> Right. I actually had. <laughs> well, I need to do that here because I was going to get asked. That's why I went to sleep early. <laughs> there you go. Smart. Smart. In all reality, um, yeah, there is this concern that um, because it does involve 120 former Trump appointees or when the administration had kind of put this together and that it couldn't come in. I want to put out there's some things in there I really agree with, but I have to tell you, I do, and Jeffrey, I do take a little bit more, um, uh, you know, I, having worked in those battles with these people or SESs and GSs, I mean, you're right, this book, this thing is right about, we need to improve that. Also, how, how do you term it? How do you determine and promote somebody? For example, 99% of people are ranked successful. You know, and there's three layers and that, you know, good, successful. But then I step back and I look at the Navy. If you've got one non-A, because it used to be A, B, C, you know, like just like grade school, Catholic grade school. And I got mostly Fs. But in any case, the bottom line was that you got one B in the Navy. You didn't make admiral. And mm -hmm. you get this report that you got once a year. 
had about 20 things you were judged on. And what you try to do after that is put in the wording something that kind of winked, winked, who you really like, like, I wish he were my son, you know? And so it got to be a game. We do that thing too. But do I think it needs to be fixed? Absolutely, that's in there. But the other ones I'm a little more concerned about. For example, and if I could step back, and, and Jeffrey, I bring this one up because you and Brian talked about in your previous podcast, the education department. And, and I bring it up because I always called education as I was a homeland defense, because in the military, it has the biggest community college in the nation, the Air Force Community College. And, uh, and, and you go on a ship in the Persian Gulf and people are sitting there online taking courses because you get a career of training or you don't get promoted. Officers have to get a master's degree you know, at least, or you don't get promoted like a nuclear because then when you're sure you're working in a specialty. So I've always looked at that as a strength. But the education department, I mean, we have to keep in mind, as you talked about in the previous podcast, one or two of you, some about cutting people or, and I understand there's been a desire because even President Obama put a freeze for a while on uh, uh, hiring people. But this education department was actually founded as the department of education, 1867. It wasn't Jimmy Carter who brought it about, or whomever. And it was done because up in the Navy, the military, uh, the government, federal government, had been so involved in education up to that point by giving up in, up in the, about 100 years, $73 million of acres free, which is worth trillions of dollars today, for people to settle west. And then they'd get an acre to build a school up. <laughs> but they finally decided, we got all these people here and people like Lincoln are learning in, uh, up in a log cabin, going to log cabin school. How, what's the right way to teach? Then all of a sudden they brought out the land grant program uh, by Pennsylvania uh, State, State, uh, 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 um, State, Penn State. And then they came out and said in 2017, we got to get Vogue Tech. It actually was called Vogue Tech and try to get that out there because of the artisans we need for welding, et cetera. Then it came along with all the military installations after World War II and said, my gosh, we're putting 20,000 people with their kids in this little beat on the town, and, and all of a sudden, we've got to give them money. And then Sputnik happened, and the part of education was tasked with all, the NDEA. Uh, we got to catch up to the Russians, you know, that national defense. And then it became Civil Rights, and then there was Disability Act. But with all that they're doing, they only 8% of the money is ever done is spent by them. If you want to look at schools, go to Chicago that's run by a state and a city where only 11%, excuse me, 11th grade, it only has 22% of its kids that can read to 11th grade level and only 19% of its kids that can read to, you know, to, to uh, 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 that level. And then we lose 7,000 kids from high school dropout every day in America, 1.2 million. And so you see there, that's a problem. But that's not a Department of Education problem in a sense because the states are running those kinds of things, okay? And, and here's why I bring it up. Because that department has the third largest discretionary budget in, of all the agencies we have. Only defense beats it and only uh, medic DHS. But it has the smallest, smallest civil service. Yeah. Right. Of any of the 17 or so cabinets, it's the most efficiently run place we have. And so I think taking broad cuts at this stuff, I mean, do you need people? But if you can do it more efficiently like Jimmy Carter wanted to do when he came in, we need to look at that. But just to say that they're burying in and they're trying to hold on, yeah, they probably are working hard at keeping their jobs. We need better merit pay, we need uh, assessments, we need better grading than we do than just all A's. We need, and by the way, Admiral Clark tried to change that in the Navy. It lasted his six years, and once he left, they went back to the old way. I'll stop well, with the concerns that we just went to the Department of Education or somebody said. Well, I, I think what Jeffrey was saying too that that they also want a different line set. They want <laughs> they want people to come in. And now, I, you know, I'm not necessarily agreeing with, but I think they wanted uh, people to come in to realize they take orders from the whoever's in the White House. That they really see it as you need to follow orders, right? I will tell you that was an issue in the Reagan. That was an issue in the Reagan era, and hence uh, somewhere along the line, he said that uh, personnel is policy. Yes, uh, because 
if you've got somebody there that believes X and the administration is devoted to Y, you've got a problem on your hands. And you know, one of the things, and Joyce uh, and John have probably heard me say this before, but I'll say it again for you, Joe. Um, is some congressman wakes up in the morning and his kid has a runny nose and he goes into the office and uh, has his staff draw up uh, legislation to create the Department of Children with Runny Noses. It gets passed. They build a 10-story building in downtown Washington, fill it with unionized employees who are making six figures, and then they look around for yet another problem to solve in the same fashion. And I think that's what has sort of engulfed Washington, D.C. I mean, hence the swamp business and all that kind of thing. And uh, it, that, I think, is a problem. And, and the other problem is and the difference increasingly, and I think you're going to see a lot of discussion about this this year in the campaign, that the difference is you've got one party that believes the solution is the government, always. You know, get the government to do A, B, C, or D. Whereas the other party says, you know, as less as you can do with the government and make it private, uh, the, the better off we will all be. Abortion and the women's right to choose, but I'm just saying. <laughs> and say, say again, Joyce, I didn't hear you. I mean, you you sounded like you were describing the Democrats' view on abortion, keeping oh. keeping doctors out of out of right government out of the house. So this whole thing gets torn around depending upon what your issue is, how much government you want, and how much government you don't want. It seems to me, but but anyway, I I, I think we we. We're dealing with an issue here that still troubles me because we do need expertise. We do need experience and expertise in these departments, right? At the same time, we can't have entrenched, it's my way, the highway in these bureaucracies. Is, is that the final analysis, what we are having to deal with, Joe? Admiral, I mean. <laughs> yeah, Joe, Joe, yes. <laughs> I want to be old, even though I fell asleep early last night. But uh, I uh, no look. This is this is this issue. I think that uh, Jeffrey speaks about. You know, that's what I liked in this study. But if I look at it a different way. Not that everybody's in the swamp. I mean, I didn't feel I was in the swamp <laughs> when I was in one of those guys working with Rocketsy. But I will tell you, can frustrating. Uh, on the whole, I found these people who are in the bureaucracy very good and helpful because they're there, and that doesn't mean. You know, I like youth because they're not burdened with experience. <laughs> you know, give me that young guy who's not. But on the other hand, I need some adults in the room. And right. Sometimes there's no wisdom there, you know, that comes from experience, honestly. He is to what is in here is, hey, look, look how difficult it is when you have a poor performer. And how can you tell who's the good performer when they're all getting A's? We need to fix that. But I, I, I got to tell you, I honestly do believe that, um, that you know, if there's kind of a swampish thing, it's like 462 uh, Congress people are working as lobbyists today. I don't know if that's a swamp or not, you know, um, or I could think of a political appointee that stopped the DEA guy from investigation looking at the pill mills in West Virginia, and this was a story, and he, he stopped it. And then he went off to become a lobbyist. I mean, I get that. And President Trump, plus his heart on this one, put out an executive order that said nobody can lobby from his administration. Nobody debated <laughs> when you look at the numbers who went to lobby. So we have an issue here called accountability. Where you, and that's the real issue to me. It's not just, you know, who's holding whom accountable, you know, and it has its downside. I mean, I can remember turning down a lobbying job and I told my wife, I mean, it was seven figures and, uh, and, and, you know, I just didn't want to do it and uh, that stuff. And, you know, she leaned forward and put her hand on my shoulder and looked at me with kind eyes and said, are you sure, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> There's a cruise coming up. <laughs> 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 right. so, I mean, it's tough, but yeah. I think it's yeah. that accountability. And, and um, I, I think we just, you know, we got to sit back, take what's good here and work forward. But I have I think that's a very, I think that's a very sage advice that everything in it isn't bad. We really need to look at it. And John, I guess, too, just to give you the final, what I'm hearing here is a lot of agreement. 
again, a lot of it, I mean, the, the Admiral is saying, yes, there's some re there's the valid reason why this needs to be looked at right now, right? And, you know, Joyce, one other thing that I would add, in addition to my story about the Department of Children with Runny Noses, some of those employees are going to work there for, what, five? They're gonna, they're, they come in two categories. They'll either work for an entire career or they'll work for five years and then go out and join a lobbying firm to influence the Department of Children with Runny Noses because they worked in the department. And, and <laughs> there you you know, go. I think that's part of the problem. <laughs> influence nasal sprays but john you have the final word <laughs> well, can i have one comment if yeah. i don't yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah. just before john because you're going to be wise yeah. and you're going to it all up <laughs> the young man right <laughs> but, you know even though i like you because you're not burdened with experience but i'll tell you i want those civil servants here at the nrca the national Re regulatory commission to have been there a long time <laughs> because you got to get that stuff right you know, I mean, there are there are places there where I value that that person has seen it or done it, uh, of these agencies. I mean, this thing about independent agencies, I'm trying to think of how Congress is going to become the regulator of Wall Street because we don't want the NCC to be around as an independent agency. I mean, we got to have a fine thing between turns and all, but keeping the experience. Uh, and, 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 I, and, and I bring that up because the Army today... Uh, is I, and actually, I, I think it's actually might even I read it in your in your project 2025 is making maybe not there is the a Marine Corps usually has very junior people uh, running things. I mean, they like people come in, be a trigger puller and go out because there are what the common term called grunts. They go out and do it. No one's braver. But that said, their E4s run their squadrons. That's a certain rate. The Army has E6s. Well, this is a recommendation to raise this up to be sixes because today in the military, things are so technical. You know, look yeah. at Ukraine. It's not how much, how fast you can run. It's who's got the best drone and kind of stuff like that. Today, to get someone into the United States Navy, we are offering in the U.S. Navy for just coming in up to $140,000 of a bonus to come in. I didn't make that as an ad initially. And so, to, to, you know, we've got to make sure we're not just putting down these civil servants because there's many fine ones there. We got to be able to attract the new ones who can understand. I mean, for example, the one thing I wish you had beefed up more in Project 2025 was cybersecurity. We've lost 17 of 18 Rand war games against China. And the Vice Chair of the Joint Chiefs Staff said two years ago that we, well, in the biggest war game we've had, lost to China because they knew what we were doing and where we were going to be. It's all about making you blind, deaf, and dumb through warfare. Who cares about how many ships you have? It's really almost more of, can you make it blind, deaf, or dumb? And yeah. I can tell yeah. you, when I pushed that issue in the Navy, boy, did I get blowback. So I understand poor Jeffrey's understanding about the bureaucracy pushing back on yeah. issues. There you go, John. I have the final word. We got a lot here, but you you take it away for us. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly a lot uh, discussed uh, during this conversation. Uh, just from the Pennsylvania angle of things, as we discuss this, um, some news from the last uh, podcast that you recorded was that we talk about this exchange of ideas, in particular Project 2025 and other issues. Well, we can confirm as of just a few days ago, former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris have formally agreed to terms on a debate and we can actually say the debate is going to take place where else but in Pennsylvania, of course. There you um, go. There on you September go. 10th, uh, Harris and Trump will meet on an ABC News debate in Philadelphia. So, just for those who want to see more of this exchange of ideas, we'll have both presidential candidates uh, debates, uh, even though it'll be a nationwide audience. It's taking place here in Pennsylvania, kind of underscoring how important Pennsylvania's 19 electoral votes are. And just one other thing that I think we should keep an eye on as the rest of this week develops is that as the DNC is going on, again, just to emphasize and perhaps a bit of my reporter bias being from Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and being a Pennsylvania reporter, is how much Pennsylvania is going to be in the limelight for the rest of this DNC. Because yeah. uh, on Monday evening, Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis delivered an address. He is the youngest Lieutenant Governor in the nation. Um, Tuesday evening, we have um, 
State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, who is running for Auditor General. He's uh, set to speak. And then later this week, there's also reports that we don't know the exact timing then, but we hear uh, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro's slated to deliver an address, as is U.S. Senator Bob Casey. So Pennsylvania, even though, again, the the, uh, the DNC is taking place in Chicago and it's uh, delegates from all 50 states uh, convening, Pennsylvania really is taking a bigger, uh, as more of the spotlight than most other states. And that's something I hope our, our readers and audience uh, keeps an eye on because I think it's really fascinating to see what their message is going to be to a national audience. Again, they are not; they are no longer in the Keystone State delivering this address when they have these speeches on primetime. They're on national television, so I'm really curious to see what those speeches are like um, moving forward for the rest of the week. Well, once and again, I, I we just, Joyce, here. I, we, I, we would, really I would say John yeah. is absolutely right. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania has always been important off and on in terms of a specific election, but I can't remember one where it has played this central of a role and is being targeted by both parties over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, people are, I mean, you know, both of these candidates or all four of the top candidates are going to be here over and over and over again. Joyce, you ought to invite them to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I tell you, we got to invite them to the battleground, that's for sure. But once again, we have consensus. We are the center of the universe. We've already known that. Now we all agree on it here. But I also want to take the opportunity to thank Admiral Sestak for joining us offering his insights and uh, the wisdom of his years of experience in both politics and government and, and in the military. So with that, I always thank Jeffrey and John. It's great to have you here. We will be back next week with another version. By then, we'll probably know just how good or bad the Democratic National Convention was. So again, thank you all. Thank you for Somewhere having me. William Penn is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Enjoy. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.